this series of sermons um, uh, that people ask difficult questions, and uh, that's what we continue to look at today. How can I have victory over worry? How can I have victory over worry? We know that our Lord Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And in many ways, Christians are being crucified between two thieves as well. There's the thief of regret about the past and the thief of the worry about tomorrow. And so in many ways, Christians are just like our Lord, being crucified between two things that rob us of our joy regrets of the past, and worries about tomorrow. We worry about so many things. Even as I speak to you this morning, perhaps there are things that are foremost in worry on your mind. When I think of the Lord visiting that home in Cana of Galilee, uh, the home of Mary and Martha. And remember, Martha was worried about many things. It's estimated that our generation is three times more anxious than the previous generation. We worry about so many things, things close to home and things far away, things pertaining to our health, things concerning our family, our jobs, uh, the animals, all kinds of things we worry about, and also greater things like uh, the global nuclear war threat, which is so imminent today. We see it in our paper on a weekly basis. There's growing conflict in the Middle East Will it suck in other nations? Will it be the commencement of the Third World War? These things worry us. Climate change, economic pressure, social decline, rampant crime, on and on it goes, the things we worry about. And yet we must say, and yet we must conclude, that worry doesn't change a thing. Worry is faith in the negative. Worry is the interest we pay on tomorrow's troubles. Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives us something to do, but takes us nowhere. Worry pulls the clouds of today over tomorrow's sunshine. We're going to look at the subject of worry, and we're going to go to the classic passage that the Lord Jesus gives, and we're going to see in this passage six times the word worry comes up, and three times Jesus says, do not worry. We come then to the feet of the master teacher, the Lord Jesus, as he speaks to those in his day who are worried and as he speaks to us in our day. Jesus, the master teacher, uses excellent logic, but down-to-earth practical examples. We must remember that he is speaking to farmers and fishermen, just ordinary people. And so he uses visual examples of those things that touched every part of their life, he draws them in and draws profound lessons from the everyday things. Let us come then to look first at why we are not to worry. And the first thing I want to point out to you from verse 25, that worry is inconsistent. Worry is inconsistent. Now, if your Bible is open, you'll note there, <clears throat> verse 25, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, or what you'll wear. Is life not more important than clothes? And so the first argument the Lord Jesus says is, God created you. God formed you. God fashioned you. Psalm 139. He knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, Lord, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The sovereign God created you. And therefore, will he create you and then neglect you? It's inconsistent to think that God would go to all the trouble of making you so beautiful, so unique, and then would walk away and neglect you. It's exactly what Jesus says. Is, it, is life not more important than food and the body more important than clothes? God gave you life. He will not neglect you. Which builder builds a house only to let it run down and decay? Which person prepares a meal only to let it go green? Who bakes a lovely fruitcake? And there's nothing like a fruitcake. Just to leave it get neglected. 
Who does that? Nobody. You make it with a purpose. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. You create things with a purpose. You created me in all my wonder and amazement. You are not going to walk away from me. That's what Jesus says. If God in grace created you, he is not going to walk away from you. In fact, the Bible puts it beautifully because it reminds us that he not only created you, but he redeemed you. He not only created you, but he redeemed you. So you are twice over his. You are his by creation, and you are his by redemption, salvation. We are twice over his. He won't neglect us. He's got a purpose for your life. I found this lovely verse, and it's so pertinent. It's in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If he gave his son for us, will he not graciously give us all things? So number one, it's inconsistent. God created us, he will look after us. Number two, in verse 26 it says this, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? To worry is irrational. To worry is irrational. If he cares for the birds, so numerous, if he cares for them, will he not care for you? And remember, these are farmers. They would know about birds. You see, when they tilled their field, when they turned the soil over, the birds were there to eat the grubs and the worms. The birds were there. And when they sowed the seed, the birds were there in their masses. And when the crop was ready to be harvested, the birds were there. You see, the birds were part of their life. In fact, I'm told that over Palestine is a highway, as it were, for migrating birds. Birds in Africa migrate over Israel towards Europe, and then come from Europe and go over Israel to Africa. It's the passageway where the birds fly over. They knew what it was to see thousands and thousands of birds. And Jesus says, if he cares for the birds in their prolific numbers, will he not also not care for you? We sung today, his eye is on the sparrow and he watches over you. We, we haven't got many sparrows here, but often when we walk, Sue and I, uh, in, the, uh, in the bush, those little fantails come. And they're so dainty, they're so precious, and they flit around you. Or on other occasions, you hear from time to time the sweet, shrill sound of the bellbird. Or you see the swooping um, uh, uh, swallows and how agile they are. They're so small that they weigh almost nothing. And yet the Lord cares for the birds of the air. Will he not much more care for us, for whom he gave his life's blood? Oh, how foolish we are to worry. Worry is inconsistent with the creation of God. Worry is irrational. But then also worry is ineffective. Worry is ineffective. You note there Jesus says in verse 27, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Who of you by worrying can really change anything in your life? Worry is absolutely futile. There's two ideas here. Bible translators translate it in two ways. They either say, can add a single uh, hour to your life or any height to you. I wish we could. I would love to be a little bit taller, a good couple of centimeters taller, but I'm not, and worrying's not going to change it. You see, worry is ineffective. Worry changes nothing. Worry's not going to give you more years. In fact, the medical people here present will tell us well that worry will shorten your life. Worry has all kinds of bad side effects. Worry develops heart problems. Worry can develop ulcers in the stomach. Worry can lead to strokes. Worry can lead to obesity. Worry can lead to headaches and insomnia and depression and accelerated aging and prem premature death. Worry does quite the opposite. It doesn't help us. It doesn't benefit. It doesn't prosper us. It doesn't change anything. It just destroys. The Bible says, do not fret. It leads to evil. 
Worry is ineffective and unproductive. It is irrational to worry. It does not benefit you at all. And then we must also say, fourthly, worry is illogical. Look there in verse 28. And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So we must say worry is illogical. If he clothes the flowers of the fields and the grass of the fields. And, and again, we must understand these Palestinian people. They knew what it was to live in a semi-desert area, but they also knew the transformation of the early rains. When the early rain came and fell on that dry soil and latent in the soil was all kinds of seeds, in no time the green grass would come up and the flowers would come up and it would turn into a wonderland of beautiful colors and a variety of grass and it was beautiful for three weeks, four weeks and then that hot Sirocco wind would come blowing in off the desert and parch everything. Soon the flowers would fall over, soon the grass would parch and the people would gather the grass and the flowers, and use it for kindling in the fire. It's exactly what he says, that they're here for a few days and then thrown into the fire. They made outside ovens. They baked their food on outside ovens, and they needed kindling. That grass and flower, which once looked so beautiful, is now used for kindling. If he clothes the grass of the field in their variety, beauty and splendor, will he not clothe us? For those who come from South Africa... There's an area inland called Namaqualand. And uh, for about three or four weeks of the year, the Namaqualand daisies are magnificent. People travel in tourist buses to the Namaqualand daisies because that area, which is semi-desert, when it gets the first rains, is just a kaleidoscope of the most magnificent hues and colors as far as the eye can see. The flowers are magnificent. The tourists come from all over to see the Namaqualand daisies. And if you've seen it once, you'll never forget it. And then after a few weeks, the hot African sun parches it all so dry, and it's lost for another season. Jesus says, if our God clothes the lilies of the field and the grass of the field so well, will he not clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Friend, it's illogical to worry about things. When God cares for nature, will he much more not care for us? And then worry is irreligious, and maybe this is his most powerful argument. Look there in verse 31 and 32. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need him. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Worry is irreligious. He says, the pagans, the ungodly, those who have no God, those who have no redeemer, they've got grounds to worry, but on the contrary, you don't. They know nothing of the saving grace of God. They know nothing of his mercy and compassion. They know nothing of the freedom of sins forgiven. They know nothing of the presence and indwelling and guidance of the precious Holy Spirit. They don't know these things. They're pagans. Yes, they can run after these things and worry and fret. But us, who have a redeeming God, who has a God who loves us, who cares for us, who says to us, I'm your father. In this passage, it says a number of times, I'm your father. Remember there in <clears throat> the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus says, when you pray, pray, our father. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, we have a God who cares for us. And again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, but you are a, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. I love that. 
you're the possession. The blood-bought possession of God. He not only made you, but he redeemed you. you his treasured possession. In fact, in, in Malachi it says, we, we're the jewel in his crown. We're the apple of his eye. Do you know what it means when it says the apple of the eye? It means the pupil. And, and if you point at someone's eye, they will protect the pupil of their eye. We are that which God protects. Two birds were sitting on a wire. The robin said to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. We have a God who cares for us. We're not pagan. We redeemed with a community of faith. So worry is irreligious. We've seen worry is inconsistent because God made us. Worry is irrational. He cares for the birds, he'll care for us. Worry is ineffective. It doesn't change a thing, doesn't add to our heart, to our days. Worry is illogical. If he cares for the flowers, surely logic tells me he'll care for me. And worry is irreligious. The pagans may worry, they have no God. We have an amazing God who loves us with a Calvary love. Secondly, I want to point out to you, and I've only got two points today. Secondly, I want to see, how can I overcome worry? Jesus has established how futile worry is. How then, and what can I do to overcome worry? I want to suggest three things. Number one, we need to trust God more. We need to trust God more. We need to ignore the lie that's said around, the lie that's spread around and spawned around by others, that there are too many people on the planet. There are um, 9,7 million people on the planet. Sorry, 9,7 billion people on the planet. How can God possibly care for us? How can God be concerned for us? And yet, he is. This passage four times over refers to God as our Father. The first time he says, when you pray, in chapter 6, go into your room and speak to your Father who is in secret, and your Father in secret will reward you. And then he says, pray our Father, give us today our daily bread. And now he says, your Father knows what you need. My friends, we have a Father. Let us be people who trust him. Um, Hebrews chapter 13 says, Never will I leave you, God speaking. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Others may forsake you. Others may turn from you, but I will not. In fact, it was 40 years ago this year that God gave me a promise. It was my last day of work. Uh, I still work. Ministry is work, but I was at secular work. I was a printer at a big factory with a massive machine the size of this whole church, printing things. And as I looked at the newspaper, at the back of the newspaper, they would have a Bible verse. And that Bible verse, I just felt God was saying to me, that's for you, because the devil was saying to me, you're throwing your life away. You're wasting a good career. What on earth are you doing? Entering ministry, going to study. And the verse was this. It was Isaiah 41, verse 10. I cut it out, and I stuck it on the dashboard of my little VW Beetle, and it, it eventually it faded and disintegrated with the African sun. And the words were these. So do not fear, for I am with you. <clears throat> do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I stand before you 40 years later and say, God has been faithful. Let us trust him. Peter says, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. A better translation would be, cast all your anxiety upon him, here the twist comes, because you are his concern. God's primary concern in all of creation is his people. The highest thing on God's agenda is his people, and you are his people in Christ. Let us trust him implicitly and explicitly. Secondly, not only trust him, but let's be prayerful. We have um, 
an open invitation. There's a lovely passage in uh, the book of the Revelation, chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, And I saw a door standing open in heaven. It's lovely. God's door is open. There's no reserve. There's no gone for five minutes. There's no be back, uh, be back later. No, no, no. His door is open. And we can speak to him in prayer. It is a lie from the pit of hell that says we are abandoned, we are deserted. There was a philosophy called deism, which says God started the earth and has stepped back, very much like those old alarm clocks that you used to wind up and then leave it to run its course. God has withdrawn from society, and one day he will intervene again. And between that point and this point, we're on our own. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God has not abandoned us, forsaken us, dumped us for... God does not divorce his people. God does, in fact, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. Did you know that? It says that in, in um, John 14 and verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Can a mother forsake the child at her breast, says the writer of Isaiah and have no compassion on the one she is born, though she may forget, I will not forget you. I love that passage because it does something unusual. It casts God in the feminine. Now, most of all passages always speak of God as, as our Father, God our Father, um, and, and that's the overwhelming emphasis of Scripture. But from time to time, when God really wants to show his gracious tender compassion. He casts himself in the feminine, and this verse does that. Can a mother forget her baby at her breast and have no compassion for the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Isn't that amazing? That as a mother cares for a child, God will care for us. As a mother nurtures a child and cannot forget the child she has born, God says, I will never forget you. Perhaps the most clear verse against worry, apart from what Jesus says, is the one in Philippians 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. And the peace of God, the shalom of God will guard. The word God is bastion about or castle around. God will put a castle wall around your heart when you trust him. Does he not say, come to me all that are weary and burdened? Is that God's word to you today? With your worry, with your anxiety, come to me. Do you know God's favorite word is the word come? He is the inviting God. In, Saul, in uh, Revelation 22 and verse 17, it says, the spirit says, come. And let the one who hears, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes come and take freely. God says, come to me. Why do you travail as you do? Come to me. The problem is, you and I do this, and I include myself, we bring it to God, we bring the problem to him, and then we take it away and try and solve it ourselves. Now, which of us takes our car to the mechanic and then says, well, I'm going to just advise you whilst you fix the car? We don't do that. Or which of you takes your TV or VAC or whatever you take to the repairman and say, by the way, I'm just going to camp with you for the next two days and just watch what you do and advise you on how to fix this. You don't do that. You drop it off. You walk away. When they contact you, you come back again when it's fixed. And that's how we need to deal with, with God. Bring it to him. Lay at his feet, and then don't try and solve it, but say, Lord, you are sovereign. I'll wait for your guidance, and I entrust it to you. We used to sing, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. I wonder if there's someone listening here in the church or online and you're still trying to meddle your way through the solution to that problem. Won't you trust God? Won't you see him work wonders? For our family this past week, we had an anxious time. We had to pray earnestly. One of our little grandkids, uh, Katie, got sick and the temperature was high. And when we took her to the doctor, the doctor said, straight to Starship. And we found she had pneumonia. 
We had to pray hard, pray anxiously, and commit her little frail body to the hands of a great God. She's well today. We give thanks to God for that. But we were, we were drawn out in prayer. And so I encourage you, when you have those anxious moments, to go to God in prayer. May I say lastly, we must be committed. Back to the words of Jesus, and you'll see there at the end of our passage, he says, for the pagans run after all these things, but for you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What's the these things? The things he's just referred to, our food, our clothing, our family, our anxiety. All these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Note we must be committed. Committed to the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. What is it to seek first the kingdom of God? It's to honor God. It's to serve God. It's to put God first. It's to say, not my will, but yours be done. Didn't Jesus pray like that? Not my will, but yours be done. Have your best way in my life. You see, we almost pray, my will be done, my kingdom come. It's not about my will and my kingdom. It's about God's kingdom and God's will. And therefore we say, Lord, I commit it to you, believing you will do what's best, your kingdom come, your name above all else. I'm not going to look for the easy way. I'm not going to cap capitulate. I want to honor you. I want your name to be glorified in this, whatever the outcome. At the moment, I'm praying with a colleague of mine, a friend, minister, whose wife is dying of cancer. And as he watches her fade away, they're both praying, Lord, may you be glorified in this illness. They're turning their trial that God would be on it. You see, that's how we live. We don't live all about me and my world and my happiness, but God, your world and your happiness, whatever the outcome. You see, when God is put first and ourselves are put last, we line ourselves up for God's provision. I want to say that again. When we put God first and ourselves last, we line ourselves up for God's provision, whatever that might be. Seek first the kingdom of God. What have we seen today? Jesus, very pertinent Remind us for us not to worry that it's inconsistent, it's irrational, it's ineffective, it's illogical, and it's irreligious to worry. We've also seen that we must be trusting, look to him as our father, that we must be prayerful in all things, and we must be committed not to our kingdom but to his kingdom, for that's always the best. Remember to start with, I spoke of two thieves. One, Yesterday's regrets to tomorrow's worries. Let's not be crucified and lose our joy by those two things. When I study this passage and I reflected on it, I often do that, take a day or two to reflect on what I've said. I realized that I missed something very important. And the important thing is those last verses, that last verse. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, trust me one day at a time. Don't worry about yesterday and don't be anxious about tomorrow. It's about today. Today, trust me, one day at a time. One moment at a time. Trust me for today. In fact, the songwriter w said this, one day at a time, dear Jesus, one day at a time. That's all I'm asking from you. Just give me the strength to do all that I must do one day at a time. Yesterday is gone, dear Jesus. Tomorrow will never be mine. Lord, help me today. Show me the way one day at a time. We live to honor God today, and the future is in his hands. Let us bow in prayer. What is it that's been pressing down on your soul? What is it that's been robbing you of joy? 
It's been a weight on your chest, heavy on your shoulders. It's clouded the days ahead. There's so much anxiety which is squeezing the life out of you. You're allowing yourself to be crucified on yesterday's regrets and tomorrow's worries. Will you, like me, join and just say, Lord, today, today I'll honor you. Today I'll serve you. Today I'll be the best I can be for you. And I'll leave my tomorrows in your hands. Deliver us, Lord, from being crucified on yesterday's regrets and tomorrow's worries. Help us to live, to honor you, not as the pagans do who have no God, but as the godly do who have our Father who cares. Help us to trust you, to do what's best, and to seek first your kingdom above all else. In Jesus' name, amen.